The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail God hath hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The title of this message is Vanity of Vanities. I think Solomon put it great. I don't need to change it. Vanity of vanities. And when we look at the man Solomon, if you would, keep your finger there in Ecclesiastes, and we can go back to 2 Chronicles. If you look at the man Solomon, he was one that was a very wise man. In 2 Chronicles, in chapter 1, we read about his beginnings. A very, very humble beginning, though he was the son of a king. Beginning in verse 7 of 2 Chronicles, chapter 1, In that night did God appear unto Solomon, and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast shewed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established. For thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? So immediately after being presented with the idea that he would be king, uh, Solomon is visited by the Lord in the night. And the Lord asks him, ask what I shall give thee, is the one question. Many of us would have all sorts of things that we would ask at a time like this. But Solomon... And his humility asks to give me now wisdom and knowledge. And humility, he reaches out to God in prayer, hoping to receive enough wherewith he could go out and in before this people and judge the people of God and set before them, though they are a great multitude, the proper wisdom, the proper example, the proper knowledge fit for the Lord's people. In verse 11, God said to Solomon, Because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people, over whom I have made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee. God faithfully answers the prayer of Solomon. It continues, And I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee. Neither shall there be any, neither shall there any after thee have 
the like. So in humility, Solomon asks for wisdom and knowledge that would benefit those around him, that he could properly lead the people of Israel. And God takes the humility, and as he promises in Scripture, humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he shall exalt thee in due time. Humble being exalted, the proud abased is what the scripture teaches. And therefore God, faithful and true to his promise, answers the prayer of Solomon. And above all of those things, adds unto him the things that lesser men probably would have asked for. First being riches and wealth and honor and all of those long life and things like that that, that we often covet after. <clears throat> he had great wisdom, he had great wealth, and he had great honor. It all started in this situation as it played out. You can turn to 2 Chronicles 9. 2 Chronicles 9. We know of Solomon and his great wisdom. We know that he wrote many of the scriptures. We know that Ecclesiastes was penned by him. That's what we're going to be walking through now. Proverbs is of Solomon. Song of Solomon specifically is of Solomon. And the Bible records that he wrote many other Proverbs. He wrote of uh, animals and creatures. Sciences were an interest of his. He wrote many things that we don't have contained in the scriptures. But as Solomon himself, it is recorded in scriptures that he wrote these things. We know that he built the temple and was was the uh, was the man with with the wherewithal to complete it and to fulfill his father's hopes and his father's dreams of building that temple. Because David had bloody hands and could not do so, it was passed on to Solomon. In 2 Chronicles 9, verse 1 through 8, we see the great esteem that he was held in. And when the queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem, with a very great company of camels that bear spices and gold in abundance and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions, and there was nothing hid from Solomon which he told her not. Verse 4, And the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, his cupbearer also, and their apparel, and his, his accents by which he went up into the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit of her when she saw these things. And she said unto the king, in verse 5, It was of a true, it was a true report which I heard in mine own land of thine acts and thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not their words until I came and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou exceedest the fame that I heard. Happy are thy men, and happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne to be king for the Lord thy God, because Thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore made he thee king over them to do just judgment and justice. So we see when this queen who had great wealth and had great wisdom and had great great hordes, when you, when you see that what followed her was the great company of camels, spices, and abundance, her great in her own land hears of the rumor of Solomon and testifies that half of his wisdom was not even revealed to her by the word which she heard from her faraway land. And he expounded unto her of all of her questions, explained all that was in, was in her heart to know, and the spirit left her because she was just dumbfounded with how much Solomon knew, the great esteem that was placed on him. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 11. And as we read this, we see the greatness of Solomon. We see all the scriptures he wrote. We see the, the, the great esteem that he's held in by many other leaders of his time. We see that he was rich above all. He, he held lands above all. He had a great time of peace over the lands because he ruled them uh, wholeheartedly. The peace that flowed through uh, far and wide was because he was so great and powerful that none could stand against him. And yet we're reminded when we read what's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 11 that Solomon was but a man. And don't forget this. Look at verse 1. But, but King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in to you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princes, and three princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away 
his heart as promised. The Bible records in verse 6, it says, And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. And as promised, this man who is of great esteem, this man who had great wisdom to lead, was deceived as his heart was drawn away by the women of these other lands. And as God promised would happen when he turned his heart away and did that which was unrighteous and wrong in the sight of God, not in the same way as David did as he fully sought after the Lord with his heart. We see that Solomon himself fell. And we don't need to forget this. We can't forget this, that the best of men are men at best. The best of men are men at best. And this is just one of the cases that we see. We can turn back to Ecclesiastes. Just giving an overview of who, who Solomon was. We see that he was great in wisdom, yet we see at the end of his life, even wisdom that he maintained and that he held and that he had was not enough to keep him from essentially being a, a, a byword. We, we all know Solomon is the man with 700 wives, yet some people don't exactly know him for the specific writings that we're about to behold in Ecclesiastes or maybe even some other things. There's many things about the man Solomon that have been taken away from him because he fell in the later days. But when we look at this book in particular, the book of Ecclesiastes, we see that it starts off in verse 1 and verse 2, and in an interesting way it says, the words of the preacher. And if you look down at verse 2, it says, Vanity of vanity, saith the who? The preacher. So I've often heard, and I think it is wise, when we see something like that begin a book, we need to understand that, is this Bible? Yes. Are these the words of men? Yes. Because who's being highlighted as the words? The words here belong to the preacher. The vanity of vanities, who's saying that? The preacher. And too often when we, and very often when we look through the scriptures, we'll see, uh, the word of the Lord, right? Uh, Ezekiel is just full of that. The word of the Lord came unto me. The word of the Lord came unto me just over and over and over. And when he finishes his preaching, it'll say, saith the Lord. He'll say, he'll say, you're going to be judged, saith the Lord. And it comes out in that way all of the time. But Ecclesiastes is a book that's kind of set apart where it says, hey, here are the words of the preacher. Here is the vanity of vanities. What I'm going to talk about now, saith the preacher. Again, the word of the Lord, because it's in the Bible. It's contained within the canon of scriptures. But also we need to focus in on the fact that it's the words of the preacher as well. Why am I making such an important part of this? Because the Bible records truly what men say, but it doesn't always give credence to what men say as being the truth. Does that make sense? There are wrong words recorded in there. The words of Satan are recorded in the Bible, true in their form. But he's, the, he's a liar, the father of liars from the beginning. So when we read the words of Satan, we obviously don't take them as the words of God and apply them to us in the same way that we would something that says very clearly, thus saith the Lord. Anything that's recorded by the narrator, you can just, you can just stamp that and say, yes, that is the word of the Lord. This is, this is God narrating his own story. You know, his story, his story, right? But when you see a man speaking, or you see, saith Abimelech, or saith David, sometimes you just have to have a little discernment about what's actually being said here, and don't always take it at face value as thus saith the Lord. And I think the book of Ecclesiastes is a good example of this. And as we read, we'll just try to be mindful of that fact that everything that is said here, yes, it's true it was said, but it's not necessarily, though it was said, true. We need to be watchful of these things. So... Again, though, we would, we would recognize that he was the wisest man of all, and it was the wisdom of God that was imparted unto him. Therefore, there is, there is a lot to learn, a lot to glean, a lot to behold, a lot to help us contained within these scriptures. Verse 2 says this, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He said vanity five times in there. So, it originally, and, and, and just right off the bat, he's trying to get this idea across that this is what he's going to be talking about. Something that is vain. If you look down, in verse 3 it says, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? And vanity, to me, connects immediately in that context to that, that question, what profit? Something that is vain has no profit. So what profit hath a man? Well, it's vanity is what's being talked about here. The man and his labor is what we're going to start focusing in on here. What profit hath the man? What profit hath a man, a human, in their toil, in their work, in their efforts, in their strife, which they taketh under the sun? 
I believe right away we can already know that this is a, a vain question. It's a rhetorical question because he already answered it saying it, it is vanity. His endeavor, his every endeavor mankind taketh under the sun is vanity. We know that in James chapter 4 and verse 14 it says this, What is your life? It is even a vapor. And that's in comparison to what's about to be discussed right here in verse 4 of Ecclesiastes. It says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. So your life in, on this earth is vain. It is just a vapor. It's just a puff of smoke. It's just a pume of smoke that just rises and disappears, and it's gone. And this is in comparison with the longevity of, of the earth. Now we understand that there one day will be a new heaven and a new earth. This earth is finite. But to the man, to the preacher, in all practical sense of it, because there is one generation passing away and another coming, it's, it's, it's vanity. There's nothing to it because this earth will abide forever. Again, in the context of the comparison with our short, vaporous lifestyles, and our short, vaporous lives. So, if you continually continually read down in verse 5, he begins to highlight this. He begins to explain what he means by man's generation passeth, another coming, and how his labor is of no profit, how it is vanity what goes on underneath the sun. Look in verse 5 through 7. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about into the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, tither till they return again. So we see that a generation of man passeth away, and another comes behind it. But in comparison, we see that the sun, for example, and this is showing the cyclical day, the, as we know it, how the sun arises and the sun sets, and in 24 hours it's going to, well, what does it say? It's going to return where he arose. So in other words, there isn't one sun passing away and another coming behind it. It's the same one cyclically and continually. In verse 6, talks about the weather patterns, talks about how the wind whirleth about, goeth toward the south, cometh up toward the north, and hasteth, the Bible says, it whirleth about continually, and returneth again according to his circuits. So that same circuit is continual, right? It does not end. It's not like a wind come and another come behind it. It's that same wind according to its circuits. And in verse 7, again, here we have that hydrologic cycle, as science discovered it, the fact that the rivers are all running into the sea, and yet what we would expect is that the sea would be full. And yet, the, wa the waters that are in the sea return again where they came from, and then they fall again into the rivers, right? That's how we know is, what we know is the hydrologic cycle, where the evaporation of the sea cometh and taketh the clouds inland, and then they fall as rain, and then that same water flows back to the rivers and goes through that same cycle again. So man has an end, but the earth doesn't. It continueth on and on and on and on. As the Bible says here, the earth abideth forever. And this highlights the, the brevity, the smallness, the, 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 the vanity, essentially, of mankind and our understanding and our ways and our lives. When you compare with the sights that are seen going on in this world that continueth and continueth and continueth. Verse 8 says, all things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. What I believe you're seeing here is that man can't utter or explain or even begin to know all of what's been seen here. And the hydrologic cycle is just one, how we recently discovered that those invisible specks of the water come up and then they become clouds and then they return. It's a recent observation. And, and yet there are many other observations, aside from just these three examples, that man hasn't even begun to have a grasp of, that they could utter it and explain it. And yet the, the shock and awe is, is that these things have always been there. 
Verse 9 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So as far as our natural world is concerned, there is no new thing under the sun. And yet, we cannot utter it. Yet we have no understanding of it. We have no grasp of all of the wonders that go upon in this world. You would think after thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years, we would get what's going on within this world, and yet man cannot utter it, right? 6,000 years of human history is going to span the test of time, and yet man will still be standing at the end of it all with no understanding of all things that are to behold and understood in the context of what's underneath the sun. We cannot utter it, and yet it's always been there. So it is vain. It is vanity. It is futile for us, I believe, to try to comprehend what's going on in this world because of our futility, because we are finite and these things walk about and continue as they do. Verse 10 says, Is there anything whereof it may be said? See, this is new. It hath already been of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. And this is the major problem that man has, is there is no remembrance of these things. Men are generally nearsighted. We're generally short-sighted and largely forgetful. There is no remembrance, verse 11 says, and this is the problem. This is why we cannot utter the things, though there is no new thing under the sun. We have no understanding of what has happened before, therefore we stand here without understanding of what's going on now. There's no remembrance of former things. There's no way that these could be transmitted unto us because men eventually forget. And then things have to be rewritten, and things have to be rediscovered, and things have to be re-uttered re and, and explained as we discover these things. And this is a vain truth of mankind. Our vaporous life is but a cloud, and then it just goeth away. And then all things that were former are now forgotten. And then a new generation cometh that knoweth not these same things, and they fall into the same ideals, where they have to rewrite the books, where they have to re-understand what's going on in the natural world, because we've lost the wisdom that was past. But now enter Solomon. In verse 12 he says, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. So we see already that Solomon firstly, had the wisdom of God imparted unto him. He prayed that he would have wisdom and knowledge in order to lead about his people, and God immediately answered that prayer with the affirmative. But it's not just wisdom that he has. It says here, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And God promised in the scriptures before that he would, he would in Jerusalem and in Israel, be the greatest of kings. The most wealth would be his. So he had, yes, first the wisdom of God, but now he also has been imparted the status, status and the wealth and the resources as king over Jerusalem, the greatest empire at the time. Verse 13 says, And I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. The Bible reveals here that not only did he have the wisdom of God, status, wealth, resources, he also had a desire and a heart toward the work. And a vision, the fourth thing I noticed, that went beyond the things that were done under the sun, as we see the first question asked in verse 3, what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? We see that Solomon, he had the wisdom of God, the status, the wealth, the resources, the heart's desire to seek the work, to seek wisdom and understanding and knowledge of this world. But he also had a vision, because notice what it says in verse 13, it says, concerning all things that are done under heaven. He wasn't content just to understand what was done under the sun. He wanted to know what was done under heaven. And so what man was there otherwise that had the means and the faculty to know all things concerning the God that God hath given regarding the sword travail which man hath under this earth. What man had more ability, had more capability, faculties, means to finish the task of understanding the vanity of men as they walk upon the face of the earth? Verse 13 says, This sword travail hath God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. And this is the all things which Solomon wants to understand of what's under heaven. But on a quick glance, he re immediately realizes 
that at first glance, at first looks, that the works are what? Verse 14. I have seen, his eyes have beheld this, all the works that are done under sun, under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So in Ecclesiastes 1, we have him starting to outline, it's all vanity, right? And then he starts to describe what he sees. He sees that there is no profit to a man's labor under the sun. And why? Because he is but a vapor. He is a generation that passeth away, and that other generation cometh behind him. And there's no remembrance of those former things. The world has all these great glories for us to behold, and yet men cannot utter them. And yet Solomon stands up, and he's a man who is living at a time of peace. He has the wisdom of God. He has status and wealth and resources. The desire in his heart to know and understand these things. And a vision that far exceeds any man before. Who's not just interested in what's going on under the sun, but he wants to understand what's going on in heaven. What other man was more capable of these things? And yet at first glance he sees, behold, the works are all vanity and vexation of spirit. He's come, he's come full circle in his understanding in verse 15. A, begins again to highlight that same truth. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. This earth is broken. Everything under the sun is broken. It is doomed. It is struggling and striving. He, he said that there is great labor in these things, and how the world works, and how, how, the, how the hydrologic cycle works, and how the sun ariseth and returneth to where it goes, and how the rivers don't fill up, but rather they run to the same place they go. He sees that the world does take upon itself and its creation all of these great works, all of these great labors, and yet he recognizes it's broken. These works that are under the sun, the works of men, they're crooked. They can't be made straight. They're wanting, and those things that are wanting cannot be numbered. It's innumerable, the problems that we're facing in this vain world. So what profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? It's vanity and vexation of spirit. It's crooked, it can't be made straight. It's wanting, and its wantonness cannot be numbered. This is a sore travail that God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised, to be worked, to be toiled within. He says exercise therewith, that's why you have this sore travail. So Solomon stands back and though he can behold all the great wonders that are within creation and he can get a grasp of them and understand them and explain them very clearly, though these are probably truths that were discovered by earlier generations and let, yet the remembrance passed from them, he looks upon these things and recognizes that, hey, it's, it's broken. It can't be fixed. And though I understand these things, it's even vanity to understand these things. There is an endlessly wanting earth under heaven. There is an endlessly wanting and crooked world to behold under the sun. And yet Solomon still stands here and he's, he treats this as if it's a great journey of his life to continue to understand these things. Though immediately at the beginning of, of the onset of his journey, he realizes that even this is vanity and vexation of spirit. Verse 16, I commune with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom, and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. Vanity, that means emptiness uselessness. The vexation is the idea of being aggravated, being hurt, being harmed by what's beheld. And here this great man who has the wisdom of God, the status, wealth, and resources, the desire of the heart, the vision far beyond what men would behold, beholding what's under the sun. He seeks to know what's under the heavens. He sees and all he sees is broken. There's an interesting thought that just came to my mind. Thank you, Lord, that, that this is essentially a precursor to Christ walking upon earth. Why? Because this man asked for the wisdom of God. He asked to behold the great wisdom of God. He, he in the realm of this earth, had status, had wealth, had resources beyond any man. So essentially, he's got more than everybody, right? God, the wisdom, right? God with the status, the wealth, he has these great things as well. The desire of the heart to understand men. Did not God come to this earth to behold the sons of men? Did not God set forth that he would, he, would, he would be touched with the feelings of the infirmities? That's what Christ did, right? And yet here is the same desire and heart to know and to understand and to seek after what's going on upon this earth. 
And that vision that is far beyond. Again, we saw that the vision of man is generated to behold what's under the sun. And yet here the vision of the preacher, the vision of Solomon, is beyond that. He wants to behold from heaven what is done. I believe God allowed Solomon to have all of these uh, attributes, have all these faculties, have all this ability within him so that he could behold what's going on upon this world and write a book just like Ecclesiastes where he says, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, say the preacher. It's empty. It's wanting. It's broken. It's futile. We try to understand these things, and yet, and yet it just, it just, like a vapor, just like our lives, passeth away. And the understanding of former things has gone with it as the generation comes and goes and comes and goes and comes and goes. We got a lot of people in the world right now that think that they can, with their wisdom, look at the state of this world and then fix it. I know what's wrong with the world here. I know what's wrong with, with this economy. I know what's wrong with this government system. I know what's wrong with this uh, war-torn nation. And we look at it from the outside, from the vantage point of Earth, right? And we try to comprehend how we would solve it and save this world. But this world, according to the wisest man that had more wisdom than me, more status, wealth, and resources than me, uh, more desire in his heart to fulfill the need to discover and to uncover what's going on under the sun, yes, but under heaven as well, more than I would. And the vision, again, to go far beyond that. He looked upon this earth and recognized that it was futile. That everything that he had learned, though he had great wisdom, though he had experience, knowledge, he knew wisdom, madness, folly. He, he started to grasp everything that was going upon in the face of the earth. He started to dig deeper and dig deeper to understand, even going as far as to know madness and folly, to know sickness of the mind and sinfulness. He was, he was trying to discover what was going on in this world, perhaps for good and right reasons that he could go and fix and save and help this hurting world, right? But what did he realize at the end of it all? First of all, it's futile. And this is coming from the wisest man that we know of, next to Jesus Christ, who is God as well. The wisest man looked at it and said, verse 18, For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The more he learned about this sinful fallen world, he didn't say, now I know how I can fix it. Now this is, this is, this is the problem that, that we have is so many nations are trying to fix it. America stepping out and trying to be like the police of the whole world and trying to make everybody American because then we would have utopia. The whole world would be like America. Well, we know how wicked that place is. But they're not the first ones to do it. Every nation, every culture that has ruled for a period of time, you know, the, ride, the sun rises and falls on Rome, right? They had the same mentality that they had it figured out. They could just envelope the entire world within the Roman system and it would create this kind of utopia because they knew by their wisdom and by their knowledge and by their labors they thought of what was under the sun they could fix it and yet Solomon he again he had that same thing he had the whole world enveloped underneath the canopy of Jerusalem underneath Israel underneath his leadership he had wisdom that God imparted unto him status wealth resources he had the vision and the desire to do what he had set out to do and knowing and seeking after the labor that is taken under the sun. At the end of it all, he said, in much wisdom is much grief. He that increases knowledge increases sorrow. The more I learned about this world, the less hope I had that I could fix this world. That which is crooked cannot be made straight and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. Though he communed with his heart and tried to understand by wisdom and grasp at things and even know the sinfulness and the madness and folly that this world had to behold, in the end it was all vexation. It was an aggravation unto his spirit. And he spent the end of his days in sorrow and penned a book like Ecclesiastes in these days, whereby we can glean the understanding of a preacher, right? And the words that this man penned that became scripture as they flowed through him. Yet we can understand his point of view as a fallen man. You know, almost with all the faculties that a great king, like the Lord Jesus was, you know, should have been when he came, all the faculties, all the ability that a great king had, and yet 
he, he looked upon it and said, I can't save it. Praise the Lord that Jesus Christ came and he saved it. He didn't Amen. turn this system around and make it all good. No, this system <clears throat> killed him. And you know what? That's probably what Solomon's realized. He probably realized that this world system, this vain, empty, crooked world is just going to kill me. That generation path, the other will come in. Jesus Christ came and through his death was able to save the soul that will go on and enjoy a new heaven and a new earth. we got to recognize and we can walk through and understand, and, and I hope to do so, the wisdom of a man that had the perspective of being under the sun, hoping to look down and see what's under heaven to get a grasp upon this world and see what he says about it. And so far it's looking bleak, vanity, vexation, futile, crooked, can't be made straight. 